You may or may not know there's a lot of stuff happening in the Diocese of Bridgeport for young adults and young people. And so we have two guests on the show today who are going to tell us about what's happening, what's out there, how to find out what's out there, and the challenges of, uh, of evangelizing to uh, young adults and young people. Um, the short answer is go to catholic203.com. The longer answer is coming up in our conversation that Bishop Caggiano is having with Stephen Velardo and Angelica Bacos. So keep your radio right here at 1350 AM for that conversation or 103.9 FM or keep us on your phone with the Veritas mobile app. The app is at the Apple App Store, the Google Play Store, or at VeritasCatholic.com. Let Me Be Frank is brought to you by a grant from Foundations in Faith. Foundations in Faith embraces innovative approaches to funding pastoral care programs in the Diocese of Bridgeport. Resources focus on energizing lifelong faith formation and discipleship and fostering a commitment to justice and accompaniment with our most vulnerable. From seminarians to retired priests, from baptism to last rites, from suburbs to inner cities, the reach is broad and the impact is meaningful. For more information, visit them on the web at foundationsinfaith.org. Okay, here we go. This is Let Me Be Frank on the Veritas Catholic Network. I'm Steve Lee, and it is my great pleasure, as always, to introduce Bishop Frank Caggiano. Hello, my friend. Hello. <laughs> today today we have a little change in our routine, right? We have two guests. Two guests, yes. And both because... of whom are doing extraordinary work with young adults. Truly, yep. And it's funny because we just did a show, Excellency, on young saints, and you talked about how young people can be so heroically holy and role models for all of us. And in order to be holy, it helps to be involved and surround yourself with others who are also striving for holiness. Companions. Correct. Accompaniment, yes. right? Exactly. Yeah. So I, I'm very excited to meet uh, our two guests today. I know they, uh, they're they doing really great work and exciting things are happening here in our diocese for young adults. So we're joined today by Steve Villardo and Angelica Backhos. Angelica is the Assistant Director of Campus Ministry for the Diocese. She's a New Jersey native with a background in young adult, college, and high school ministry, as well as elementary school catechetical work. Angelica is finishing her master's degree in catechetics and evangelization, and she lives uh, in the best town in Fairfield County. Oh, I wasn't supposed to read that part. Um, she lives in Ridgefield. Biased. <laughs> and she's a parishioner. Biased. You're biased. <laughs> She's a parishioner here at St. Mary's in Ridgefield. Um, Stephen Villardo is the chair of the Diocesan Young Adult Council and works at the diocese in the development office. Uh, Steve grew up in New York and moved to Shelton with his wife, Christina, two years ago. Together, they have one child who just turned eight months old, and they're parishioners at St. Lawrence in Shelton, which is also a very excellent town here in Fairfield yeah, County. Thank you so much for having us, Steve so, and, and Bishop yes, Frank. Thank you. We're honored to be here. My pleasure. So we represent here Connecticut, New York, and New Jersey. It's the whole tri-state here. <laughs> I think we can say at least two of those are really great states. I would also agree at least two of those are really great states, and I'm from the one that's a little less great. Yo. Happy to be here. So now, my friends, you get the first question. You get it separately, right? My question always to my guests are, to the extent that you wish to share with us your own personal journey of faith that has brought you to this position of leadership in the church. So, Angelica, would you mind going first? Absolutely. Um, so I was raised in New Jersey in a Catholic household, and I went to a Catholic parochial school there, and I attended an all-girls Catholic high school, but it was unfortunately Catholic by name only. Um, and in elementary school, I felt like I had this awareness of God. My mom always reminds me that at my first communion, I said, Mommy, I have Jesus in my heart, and I pointed to my little seven-year-old heart. So I always had this awareness of the Lord in my life and this deep love for him, but I didn't understand what that actually meant as most Catholics, you know, are experiencing these days. I didn't really know how to make the faith quote unquote my own, um, understanding how I can serve in the church and claim my identity as the Lord's beloved daughter. Um, and in high school, I started having this existential crisis where 
Um, I didn't believe God existed, but I was also really angry at him. And I eventually realized I could not be mad at someone who doesn't exist. So therefore, the Lord has to exist. What do I do with this? And I was invited um, after wrestling for so long on this high school retreat that completely radicalized my faith. And I think it was the first time I truly understood what it meant to be a beloved daughter of the Father. And I joined that ministry team in high school. I was able to run retreats for two years and serve on that leadership team, run youth group and everything like that. And I took that passion into college. Um, I spent some time with the Protestants my freshman year while our Catholic college ministry was undergoing some extreme changes. Um, We were called, um, I'm not joking, our ministry was called SIN, the acronym for Students and Newman with the tagline, SIN, it's not all that bad. And... There was a what? lot of work. I know. I w- I can't even say I wish I were joking. It was. This is how we were known across campus and at the diocese too. It was awful in all kinds of ways, and I felt such a call to really revitalize and change that name because that name was becoming our identity, and our name should be Catholic as our identity. And there was so much work to do, but. I had the opportunity to work on an interfaith council and to revitalize that ministry. And it really reignited this passion for running ministry. So when I graduated my undergrad in 2019, I actually went back to my high school um, youth ministry and I took over as youth ministry director. So I had the opportunity. Yeah, it was incredible to go back and run that ministry for several years before being called to Connecticut. But while I was in New Jersey, I really realized that You know, I was building ministry for these high schoolers and getting to love them and serve them. But I also needed a little bit of love and to be served myself. So that's where a passion for young adult ministry came in, where I had the opportunity to join a very vibrant young adult ministry in New Jersey um, to help serve in so many different ways. And it was just this uh, this opportunity to really Mm -hmm claim again my identity as a beloved daughter to step away from you know a life of sin in so many ways I was choosing him but I wasn't choosing all of him I wasn't giving him and surrendering my entire heart to him so this all really ignited my faith and ignited my passion for young adult ministry and just finding my role in the body of believers and I'm honored to have the chance to do that with college students now to take all those experiences not only bearing witness to them through my own life but sharing everything that the body does to give them a place in the church as right. well. And, and you're doing tremendous work, which we're going to talk Thank about. You. Thank you for sharing that story. Stephen, Thank what you. about your journey? Where where have you come from and where are you going? Yeah, so I guess I'll, I'll answer it in two parts, uh, Bishop. is The first is kind of how I really grew in my, my Catholic faith. Uh, so similar to Angelica, I was, I guess, in some ways, cradle Catholic. I received baptism, first communion. Um, because my parents, uh, my dad's Italian, my mom's Irish, so you have to be Catholic. Um, but their families, you know, they were Easter Christmas Catholics. Um, so I'm the, the oldest. And when I was born, they really wanted to to raise their family actively in the faith. So they started going back to church, which I think is a common story. And, you know, they go to Mass on Sunday, and they go home, and they go Mass again. And that's really it. Um, and my mom is going to different groups and, uh, for mommy and me groups. And she's seeing Protestants that are really diving into their faith, making it personal. They have these prayer groups, these support groups all around them. And she wasn't getting that in the Catholic church because all too often it's mass, check the box and done. Um, so my parents ended up converting into more Protestant non-denominational Christian churches and me being seven or eight at the time, (laughs) went right along with them. Um, So as I grew up, I kind of got into college age and I started having some um, theological challenges um, with the Protestant faith. That's probably too long for us to get into now. But to make a long story short, I started going back and reading um, the church fathers and saying kind of, okay, if I don't know with Scroll of Scriptura, I'm assuming you know, 19-year-old Steve is probably not interpreting the Word of God right. And I don't know who can. So let me go back to the oldest people I can find that were the closest to Jesus and see what they taught. Uh, and as I'm reading, I came to the realization that if I if I read the oldest, 
and then I read the second oldest and the third oldest and so on, I suddenly am only reading Catholics. Because if you track the church back, that's really where our origins are. Um, so then I said, okay, well, this is a problem for me. Because if all the people that were closest to Jesus were all Catholics, that <laughs> probably should tell me something. Uh, so I started researching the Catholic Church more um, and then en ended up being confirmed um, through that process. And fascinatingly, as I was going kind of through that personal journey and process, the rest of my family also started doing uh, that and reconverting back to the Catholic Church. Different reasons for each one, um, but now my entire family, I'm the oldest of five. One brother was still working on him, uh, but four of, uh, four of the five siblings and my parents are now all back fully in the Catholic Church, which is, which is oh, really Oh, is beautiful. that right? Yeah. Wow. Wow. So, um, so it was engagement for both of you in a sense. Absolutely. Right? In different ways. Mm -hmm. Right. So Angelica, so. You, you, in your faith journey, it was going back to, and having that experience of engagement, right? As, as a young adult. Right. Absolutely. So, so tell me about your duties now. What do you do up uh, in Danbury? <clears throat> Yeah, so as the assistant director of campus ministry, we have the opportunity. I have the opportunity, and my department has the opportunity to really work on growing and revitalizing campus ministry in different regions of the diocese. Mm -hmm. And our primary responsibility right now is in Danbury um, at the Newman Center by Western Connecticut State University. And so we have a good relationship with the school where our students have a lot of freedom in developing the kind of programming that they would like to have and offer to other Catholics or non-Catholics on campus. Mm -hmm. It really is a, a beautiful experience. And outside of the administrative task that I have every day, my greatest joys are running our Newman dinners where we have sometimes up to 50, 60 students come by and just share a meal together and it's a very Eucharistic activity that we do just mm -hmm. gathering for a feast and, and sharing hearts and loving one another. It really is incredible. We have different Lectio Divina groups that run. Uh, so students have the opportunity to not only read scripture, but engage spiritually within scripture as well. And mm -hmm. going back to what Steve says, it's hard to kind of understand um what scripture says through your own worldview, which is why you need the church to really support that mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. having the opportunity to walk students through mm -hmm. different scriptural passages or different readings from the saints has been a gift as well. And we're really growing our ministry. It's small in a sense, but the Lord started with mm -hmm. 12. So I don't think it's a bad place to start is in a smaller ministry and having the oh, opportunity to grow and not expand in those ways. It really is an incredible so, gift. So let our people know, up in Weston, you have basically a commuter school. Is that yes, correct? I believe it's about seventy to eighty percent of the campus um, are commuter students, commuter which students. is quite a large number. So it's not only a matter of reaching those students who live in the dorms, but it's also trying to not convince but give students a reason to stay and participate in campus life right. and activity right. and different seasons of life for them, different times in the semester, it's going to be challenging. So over the past year that I've been here, it's been really interesting just to kind of see the ebbs and flows of how students are participating mm -hmm. in, in mm -hmm. ministry and campus mm -hmm. activity in general. Mm -hmm. I think it changes mm -hmm. each semester and I think each group mm -hmm. of students is going to change. So mm -hmm. we're trying to navigate and discover the best ways to meet these students where they're at and provide them with the resources and opportunities that they need to access their faith and access mm -hmm. the body of believers. Mm -hmm. You know what it, it, most people may not know, but we do have an, an actual Newman Center that is a diocesan facility. So tell us about that place. Yeah. So we have the Newman Club, which is mm -hmm. on campus and that is run by the students through the university, that dynamic is set up through their student government association. But then there's the Newman Center. So the Newman Club and Newman Center are, they collaborate often because we allow the Newman Club to utilize our space. But the Newman Center is diocesan programming. And so I come in with a small team of volunteers and we're able through the Newman Center, this diocesan property and entity and diocesan team, we get to come in and provide um, ministerial resources to our students. And we really are blessed with the space. And the club on campus is also 
very blessed to have this space as well. We're the only club on campus that has their own um, building off campus, has their own advisor who doesn't work for the university. And they really acknowledge that blessing and they certainly don't take it for granted. And I think the most beautiful part is we have this incredible adoration chapel um, or just this chapel with our Lord always present. And it really is a gift. So students and I will often meet in there and just pray before the Blessed Sacrament or Mm -hmm. they'll have a Bible study there or just different one-on-one conversations. And it really is a Eucharistic community at the Newman Center. And we're really blessed to have the diocese provide that space. It's tremendous. It's tremendous. Yeah. Now, Stephen, your role in the diocese kind of complements with Angelica because you go further into the young adult world. So tell us all about that. Uh, so, Bishop, I actually have two roles at the diocese. The first is what I like to call my day job, which is uh, working for the development office. And in that role, I work with some of um, the diocese's biggest supporters, You know, people who really give very generously of their time their talents or their treasures. And I help them invest in the areas and the ministries of the church that are closest to their hearts. Um, the other role that I've been filling is as part of the diocesan young adult council. So I, well, I know you know this for the listeners, the council of young diocesan young adult council was formed about three years ago, and it's made up of young adults to support young adults. Um, so 18 to 35 are the members. And we come together throughout the year as representatives of parishes from every corner of the diocese, communities from every corner of the diocese, and say, what do young adults need? And what can our church do to support young adults? To bring them not only back to the church, but into a deeper relationship with God um, and more involved in the church. So in effect, Mm -hmm. the ministry, you are effectively the coordinator of the coordinators of all that we're doing in the diocese. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because I know it goes right back to the one, which is your vision for the diocese is that it's not about one big diocesan organization. It's about Mm -hmm. saying, what can we do as a broader church Mm -hmm. to ultimately get the Mm -hmm. individual, in this case, young adults closer to God Mm -hmm. and doing that, through creating small opportunities for them to encounter him and creating small communities, whether that's greater Stanford or greater Bridgeport or at individual Mm -hmm. parishes where you have groups of people that can walk alongside each other throughout life and bring each other closer to him. Right. And that's what the young adult council is about. So now, so basically in a sense, the two of you, the ministries you're in complement each other to mm-hmm. fill in the whole spectrum because there's complexity in every single portion of this ministry. Absolutely. So we, we say young adults, right? We're talking, you could be talking about single people, married people, people with children, people without children, right? I mean, all different yeah. vocations and states and professions, ethnicities, cultures, mm-hmm. right? It's, it's yeah. And if you think it, about right? young adults, 18 to, to late thirties is what we consider young adults. And that's, there's a big group inside of that. And there's, there's really three buckets you could call them. And you have your college Mm -hmm. students bucket in that age, and that can run from 18 to mid twenties. Then you have kind of. That's Angelica's bucket. Absolutely. Correct, Stephen? Yes. That's Angelica's bucket. (laughs) It's a good bucket. It's a great bucket. Uh, Then you have your working (laughs) professionals, um, which, you know, either directly out of high school, start a career, after college, start a career. They're working, they're dating, they're engaged, they're not quite married. And then you have people who have kind of found their vocation, whether that's religious life or marriage or consecrated life um, as a single person. And then navigating to them is how do you navigate family? How do you navigate relationships as an adult, but just starting out with you have one, two kids? as a young couple. Right. So there's a big range all within the young adult mm-hmm. bucket. And it's so mm-hmm. vital that we have the ministry working through because if we're only finding community and finding ways for you to encounter God in college or as a young family or as a young professional, or even going farther back as middle school, high school students, you know, people go through stages of life all the time and we need to, as a church, be accompanying them throughout that entire process. Right. And that's what right. young adult Angelica, ministry is trying to accomplish. 
Angelica, in your world too, it's complex, right? Because the students. Very much so. We. Yeah. Let's talk about it, that a bit. It's very. Yeah, it's it's such a great age to work with because they're really discovering themselves. And if the Catholic Church doesn't, you know, take claim to who belongs to the Lord, which are, you know, every baptized Christian, you know, the world's going to find them first. And we have the unique opportunity to really understand as best we can where they're coming from and understand the ways in which they need to be loved. Like the desire for God, as the catechism says, is written in our human hearts and we're made by God and for him. And it's understanding the unique ways that each individual is called to reflect the Lord. And so in campus ministry, we're not only trying to help them navigate which classes they should take or you know, the relationship problems that they have, friendship and romantic and everything in between or uncovering pieces of their identity or the complex parts of this world that they're struggling to reconcile with their faith. Mm -hmm. It's really about meeting them where they're at and forming them or providing them the opportunity for formation within this campus community, but then making sure that they recognize that in the same vein as confirmation is not graduation, and it's often seen as such, that your campus ministry is not your graduation from Catholicism. It's really this entry point into the universal church, just in, as Steve said, this next season of life, this next stage, kind of pouring from one bucket into the next bucket. And it's really incredible. And in a particular way, you know, our campus ministry in the Diocese of Bridgeport is run by the diocese. The formation is coming from us, but we have the opportunity to not be self-contained and to, in a sense, funnel our students into these grassroots communities within the diocese. And that's where Steve is really doing an excellent job at promoting these communities. And I'm able to say to my students, hey, we don't have anything planned for campus ministry this Friday night, but St. Ed's in New Fairfield. 10 minutes down the road has something happening. Or if you feel like driving a little bit further, you can go to a Stanford Young Adult Mass and making sure that there's deeper formation occurring, not only in campus ministry, but integrating these students into the Catholic church, not only in parish life, but young adult life as well, to make sure that we're not staying self-contained and truly embracing you know, the meaning of the word Catholic, which is universal, and making sure they find their place in that universal church. What you just described strikes me as an absolutely critically important aspect of the ministry because mm -hmm. the hope is that young people of college age and older are forming friendships that are going to be supportive in the life of faith. Right? Absolutely. We're meant to, I know this word is thrown around a lot, but there is true meaning to it. We're meant to accompany one another and to really walk right. with one another in faith. Right. It's so vital. I, I, we may be coming up to a break soon, but I'm going to, I'm just going to stay with you, Angelica. And what are some of the obstacles and, that you see to achieve what you wish to do? Like what, what are some of the obstacles the young people are experiencing or sharing with you that says, you know, we got to solve this first before they can have this relationship with Jesus. What are you seeing? Right. I think it comes down to them feeling like they're not seen. Um, the Lord does not turn his face away from us. The Lord created us. And I often use this analogy, like when we're in Eucharistic adoration, the Lord is also adoring us as if we're the only one there. And I think the biggest obstacle that our students are, you know, facing these days is they're trying any avenue to be seen. They're trying to be seen on social media. They're trying to be seen in the classroom. They're trying to be seen within a broken family situation. They're trying to stake their claim and find their identity just by being seen by the world, which is important. We are meant to be seen by the world. The Lord gifted us this incredible you know, mm -hmm. community that is the church on earth. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I would say, just in my experience, the biggest obstacle is helping them be seen by the Lord. Because the Lord does see them. They're just kind of wearing these glasses that are preventing them from seeing him looking at them and adoring them in the same way that they're meant to adore him. So it's really helping them tear down those walls that they've built, kind of like maybe take the umbrella down or pull the shades off just so they can see the Lord looking at each of them as, you know, his own beloved son or daughter. You know, Angelica, you just raised a, an interesting irony in my mind. Mm -hmm. now, now I have to give this, please God, some significant thought. Because it seems to me it is ironic and therefore problematic 
mm. that in a time when the digital content content continent allows us an unprecedented visibility in the world mm. is at the same time many people do not feel that they are seen interesting absolutely Isn't it interesting? it's almost yeah, it's paradoxical in a sense. It where, is. We're, yeah. Maybe we'll have time to break that open a little bit after the break. Absolutely. And then, Steve, you have time to think about your challenges. So you, you have. You <laughs> oh, have now the advantage. pressure's on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, welcome to Let Me Be Frank. <laughs> so. Uh, this is Let Me Be Frank with Bishop Caggiano on the Veritas Catholic Network. His Excellency is speaking with Stephen Villardo and Angelica Bacos, two of the young adult leaders here in our diocese. We'll be right back after the break. If you're concerned about your end-of-life plans, searching for a Catholic cemetery, or have loved ones who are buried in one of the 14 Catholic cemeteries throughout Fairfield County, now might be a good time to begin planning for yourself or for other family members. Call one of our family advisors at 203-742-1450 and select option 5 to leave a message or visit www.ctcemeteries.org. Many people don't realize that they can be buried with their deceased loved ones, even if all of the family's in-ground plots have been taken. The Diocese of Bridgeport Catholic Cemeteries provides in-ground burials, as well as columbarium and mausoleum options. This makes it possible to unite your family together in the same cemetery, and it's an opportunity to build a bridge for your family back to the church. Talking about this issue is not easy, but pre-need planning makes your wishes clear, reduces cost, and helps your family avoid difficult decisions at a time of grief and loss. You can start your planning now by contacting one of our family advisors at 203-742-1450 and select option 5 or visit www.ctcemeteries.org. We can guide you through the options, regulations, and considerations to help you make the best decisions for your family. The number is 203-742-1450 and select option 5 or visit www.ctcemeteries.org. Okay, welcome back to Let Me Be Frank on the Veritas Catholic Network. Uh, His Excellency has been speaking with two of the young adult leaders here in the diocese um, about some of the challenges and uh, opportunities that we have here. So, Stephen... Uh, uh, challenges on on your side of the ledger. What do you see with young adults? Bishop, I think it's really what Angelica was saying, is that young adults in today's day and age, there's so much competition for their time and their attention. And what they're looking for in that is a sense of belonging, a sense of mattering. And I think the church has that answer, but young adults are looking for that on social media. They're looking for that in sports groups and relationships, and that's not necessarily bad, but the church has not always done a great job to my generation, to Angelica's generation at welcoming them in and making them feel like they belong in the faith. Um, And I think that's on part on young adults because they don't always seek it out because there is so much competition for that time and attention. Um, And then also on the church, not always being intentional about bringing them in Um, because young adults are usually seen as they're the future of the church. They're the next generation and we worry about them because if they're not there, it's a problem. But what often gets forgotten is that young adults are the present of the church too, and they need to be involved and engaged now. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to ask you a very hard question. Probably one of the hardest questions I've asked in my podcast Uh history. So you ready? Ready. (laughs) Okay. All right. So we want to welcome young adults, right? On whose terms? Theirs or Christ's? Right. Because the church, I think okay. people will say that the mm-hmm. church needs to change in order for young adults to like that. And I would tell anyone that that's completely wrong. What needs to change is how we show young adults what it means to be authentically Catholic. Because the culture and young adults have an idea of what the church is, and that church is very different from what from who she actually is, right? And I think young adults or people in general would say, oh, well, we need drums and guitars and modern music, and that will attract young adults. Well, 
that's not necessarily true. And as a matter of fact, if you look in different fully in communion aspects of the church, you have modern music. You have a very charismatic form of worshiping. That's Catholic. You also have Catholicism that's very traditional and has chants and incense. That's also Catholic. But I think most young adults only realize one exists and they've probably seen that one done many times, not the way we would like it to be done at every Sunday mass. And so it goes back to showing young adults the true truth, the true beauty, the true goodness of our faith in how it authentically should be and bringing them into that and all of the diversity of the church. All right. So for, you get Thank a plus. You. All right. So you did okay. <laughs> uh, the reason I asked the question is because there is, there are elements in the church that say that young adults and young people are just basically spoiled, that they're basically entitled that they want what they want. And when they don't want what they get, then they go somewhere else until they get what they want. But the problem is um, they don't actually know, like most human hearts, what they really, what they really need is what they really want. And the culture keeps them distracted and enough that they, no one ever sits down with them and say, like you said beautifully, Angelica, what is it in your heart? What is it that you are, what are you looking for? The first words of John's gospel out of the Lord's mouth. So it's actually a false question, right? Because if you do enter, if you do approach it by Christ's terms, they are actually your terms yes. also, because it's the fulfillment of life is only in him. That's part of the difficulty because we have a world that doesn't see life that way. And it's not just young people, right? It's, it's even parents and it's even older people. So, yeah. Inter- that's why I was interested about college kids, because I was wondering about COVID. I was wondering about how these last few years have changed the landscape of colleges, too, and the students that go there. Do you have a sense, Angelica, from the from the ground, what's going on there? Yeah. So I arrived um, from New Jersey to the diocese in the beginning of 2022. So I really didn't have the opportunity to be on campus and see what mm-hmm. college ministry mm-hmm. in Connecticut was looking like at the time, but just seeing the aftermath of those effects. And I think Steve could say the same for young adult ministry. And I can certainly say the same for young adult ministry. It really is trying to navigate um, the post COVID era where people were feeling isolated and lost and different communities, those who were able to successfully access those Mm -hmm. young adults who were like the rest of the world feeling really isolated and lost. That's where young adults are and college students are really staking their identity these days. And so if different areas weren't as fortunate to have strong college ministry or strong young adult ministry, we kind of in a sense lost, I would argue temporarily, uh, we temporarily lost the momentum that was happening in person previous to COVID, or we, in a sense, lost the opportunity to remind them that their true identity during these trying times is within the church, within these communities. Like man was not meant to be alone and COVID really was isolating in so many ways. And I know college students you know, they have the opportunity to be in a dorm or they have the opportunity to be in a classroom and to have that communication daily. And then when that's taken away from them in the same way with young adults in the workforce or within their families, um, extended families traveling to see families out of state, when that was taken away from them too, you know, they felt lost. And like Steve and I keep mentioning, they want to be seen and it's who is looking at them during this time. And are their eyes still on them? And do these individuals, these young adults in our diocese and in the world, in the church, still feeling like, where is their attention? Where are they able to seek, you know, this gaze from another? And our Mm -hmm. challenge and our opportunity or joys to remind them that, you know, the Lord is really looking at them. So I would say Mm -hmm. it's not exclusive to campus ministry or to college ministry in general, this problem that we're facing post COVID. I would argue that in the same sense that all, you know, young adults are looking to see where they belong. Like it's our responsibility. It's our mission. It's what we've been in tasked with by the Lord to really just remind these individuals that they've been claimed and that the Lord really does have his gaze upon them. You know what I find fascinating? 
there are a million less students in colleges and universities now than there were 10 years ago in the mm. United States. So that demographic is actually declining because of the declining birth rates in many parts of the country. It's fascinating, yes. right? So communities is ever more important. And colleges, universities, some of them are under tremendous financial constra constraints as well. Absolutely. So, right. So thank God our ministry is diocesan based. Right? Yes. We really exactly. are blessed in, yeah. in so many ways to receive, you know, the church's support in supporting, you know, right. her people. Mm -hmm. That's not something a lot of universities mm -hmm. are able mm -hmm. to, mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. have. So we really are blessed in that way. Mm -hmm. Steve, Stephen, so... So in your world now, building on what Angelica is doing, so college aged, those who are professional, single, establishing themselves, those who remain single, single until, you know, later young adulthood, those who marry and those who marry and have children. Of all those different pieces of the puzzle, if, if the Lord said, I would grant you a wish for one of those groups, any wish you want, you're going to get it next, Angelica. You're, you're next going to get the same question. So you have more time to think about it. What group would you pick and what would you wish for? This might be cheating, but I, I think you really have to That's see. Right. I don't think you can break the three because life doesn't oh, okay. divide easily. Mm -hmm. Life really transitions. Mm -hmm. And I think in the church, we can't, people don't, go into easy buckets. So I think mm -hmm. my wish would be that twofold, that the communities that are out there and the opportunities for people to come together and experience fellowship and grow in their faith together is something that people can easily find and connect to. And that in the areas where that is not easy to find, that people will mm -hmm. step up to help the local priestly leaders sub and support together as lay leaders with collaboration with the priestly leaders to develop those communities, mm -hmm. um, whether that's at an individual parish or whether that's you know a group of a golfing community that wants to golf as Catholics and that's how they connect. Um, that would be my wish, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. the communities that exist become easy to connect to and that where they don't exist, that people are willing to step up and form a community. Yeah. Uh, if I may answer the question on your side of the ledger, I would, if I, I would say that if I had one wish, in addition to what you're suggesting too, I suppose, but for young couples who are having children for the first time, is to be able to find the ways to successfully and effectively support them. Mm -hmm. Because I can't imagine how difficult it is to raise little children in this world, right? Just to be able to teach the faith. And even with the best of witnesses, they're in a world where that witness is not very obvious. And it's just so, I, so like you have a, an eight month old. Exactly. Right? I, and he is, yeah. he is never going to know a world where he cannot talk to the speaker or the TV or the thermometer <laughs> Could you imagine? Us, uh, Could you imagine? Yeah. Like he will never not know yeah. a world where there's not companies constantly paying billions of dollars to get in front of him at every moment of the day and just about everything in his house uh, right, he can interact right. with. It, it's visibility. Exactly. Visibility's become a huge business, mm -hmm. but not necessarily that it makes any difference to the person who is now become visible. It may actually be the opposite yeah. effect. You almost become anonymous. Is that interesting? Yeah. Well, because companies, uh, I think, mm -hmm. and, and it's not to put the blame on them, but it's you're selling the illusion that you matter and telling people that in order to matter, you have to post on Facebook or Instagram or buy this brand or that brand because mm -hmm. people want to mm -hmm. matter. And when they don't have God, when they don't have community, when they don't have family and they don't feel like they matter, that's when you'll, they'll do those other things. So we're as a church, right. as a community, we're fighting with companies putting billions of dollars telling people you don't matter until you buy my product and we're offering it to them for free. Um, but it's it's expo right. it's giving people the opportunity 
to accept that if themselves themselves and the Holy Spirit's willing to work in their in their moment. Because we can't we right. can't force people to it. And, we can only give them the opportunity. Right. Angelica, what about what wish do you have? Oh, that's a I've had time to think about it. And I don't mean to to cop out, but I would very much agree with both of you in what you both are saying. Mm-hmm. I think if the question were um, which age demographic? My first one would be, well, of course, all these age demographics absolutely need to be you know, formed and catechized and united in the faith in the particular capacity appropriate to their age group. But I would argue young adults. And it's not that we're trying to dismiss all the other generations, but with young adults, those are the ones who are entering mm-hmm. the vocation. Those are the ones who are, you know, changing the course of history. We're not only, Steve and I talk about this all the time, we're not only the church's future, we're the church's present. And in the present, we have the chance to rework the system. We have the chance Mm -hmm. to vote with our dollar. We have the chance to stake claim to a particular belief or deny particular beliefs. So I guess, you know, my wish in that sense would be for young adults to really stake their claim in the church, to recognize that they were not only seen you know, by the world, because anyone could be seen by the world. You're like Steve said, like his son is going to be seen by the world, but he's not known by the world. And I think that's the difference. That's the reality of being a child of God is we are not only seen by him, but we're known by him. Any business, they don't care about you as soon as you spend your dollar. And I think with the Lord, you know, we are seen, but we're also known. We're known by our gifts. If young adults took a spiritual gifts inventory, worked with spiritual mentors and directors and priests and community leaders to really understand how their particular, you know, personhood relays a piece of God that literally no other person ever can, their gifts and talents being so unique to them, the Lord dying for them to have that gift and talent activated in their life. If they so choose to accept that invitation to be a member of his church, I think our world would be really different. And so I guess, you know, my answer to the question would be this recognition of gifts, but also this recognition that, you know, those gifts give us the opportunity to not only be seen, but known and claimed by our Lord as well. Mm-hmm. It's a big wish. I don't think it's impossible. No, but... I, well, listen, he's Jesus. He could do it. He could grant whatever you ask. No, no, it's Amen. true. <laughs> I, if, if I were reflecting <clears throat> on the, the, the young people you serve, and this may be a bit self-revelatory, I suppose, but when I look at my history, and I joke about it when I do confirmation, when I talk to the sponsors and talk about my history growing up, and there were things happened along the way, mistakes that were made, you know, and some of them I regret. But thank God, none of them ended up in making a decision that would have changed my life in an irrevocable way, in a way Mm. that I could not unchange. Because we all make mistakes growing up, right? But it seems to me, young people now, even before they go to college, even in high school, sometimes even younger, have choices put before them that if they make them, can change the whole trajectory of their life. For example, I, when I was growing up, to use drugs was not, it was just, I wouldn't even know where. I would, it would never have crossed my mind. And now young people are, and you see it on the news, I mean, they're engaging in it. And sometimes they're engaging in substances that they weren't even thinking they were getting that hooks them and addicts them. And that changes the whole trajectory of their life. So it's almost as if when I was growing up, I played with matches that didn't light. They are playing with matches that easily light. So if I had a prayer for this cohort is that somehow they would be prevented, that they would be saved from making decisions that would just do tremendous damage, that could do tremendous damage, right? Right. And I'm sure you've heard stories about that, Angelica. Yep. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. It's terrible. And, you know, in our chapel, we have this beautiful image of the Divine Mercy. I remember um, after I was offered this job, I walked into the Adoration Chapel. It was my second day ever in Connecticut. And I looked at that image of Divine Mercy and I knew that this job was for me. Um, I have a very particular love for the Divine Mercy. And when I'm with my students in that chapel, I often sit in front of that image and have them face the image. That way the Lord, you know, I can be his vessel and I can remind them of his mercy for them in those times where they are making these Mm -hmm. mistakes and they get to look at him. I encourage them to look at him and not at me 
because they get to look mercy in the eyes. And then they just got to turn a couple inches and then they're looking at the tabernacle. And it's in those times where they are making these mistakes, in those times where they really are falling down on their journey. They have to be reminded. They must be reminded that the Lord is their the hand that's reaching out to them to get up. Sure. Because if the lives. Lord, if we're not telling them that the Lord's hand is there, somebody else's mm-hmm. hand is going to be there and trying to lift them up. But really right. that hand is oppressing them and right. keeping them down. Right. And that's a situation right. that so many of our young people, people of all ages are really in today. But I think young adults right. are the easiest to target, especially college right. students are kind of fed all these narratives all the time, like which hand is trying to resurrect them or redeem them. And there's really only one hand who can right. truly do that yeah. for them. If, if in any of our lives, when we are truly at a low point, if we've truly messed up and still have the recognition or the, or the, or the eruption of the firm conviction that Christ still loves me, even mm. though I messed up. That's the liberating moment. Absolutely. That's Good Friday's gift, that he died for us just as we were, asking us to move forward in grace. But God's love does not have a litmus test in that regard. That's for a college-age kid or a teenager, that's truly liberating. For any age, Absolutely. right? But particularly for their age, right? Absolutely. All right. So, Steve, I'm going to ask you, what's going on in the diocese, young adults? Tell us the latest news. What are the events coming on or – well, I think the the biggest news is you'll, some of the listeners, and I'm sure yourself and Steve will remember, uh, last fall, you spoke to another young adult and you, you posed uh, to Bob, and you posed the same question. Um, and I believe his wish was that there was a way for young adults to easily connect to the diocese. Um, and uh-huh. I think Jesus answered, and that's the first, first way he answered that is he said that we'd copy Bishop Frank's. Uh, and I think Jesus answered that with the one copy we do have. We're still waiting for the other copies, uh-huh. but, you know, all in good time. Uh-huh. And, and from that conversation, that really, um, I think, was your drive to go back to the Young Adult Council and say, well, what what is the challenge for young adults? And there was really three challenges identified for young adult ministry in the diocese. Is the first, and I would argue the biggest, is that there are a lot of young adults who are active in the church that are at their parishes and they feel alone because when there's only three or four of you at a single parish and everyone else is 30 to 40 to 50 years older than you, it, you feel alone. You don't realize that there's thousands of young, or young adults spread out throughout the diocese and throughout the masses. And then beyond even those young adults who are still active in church, there's thousands more, tens of thousands more that are baptized, that are Catholic that have left their faith. So the question is, how can we effectively reach out to those young adults, those active and those less so, and give them opportunities to encounter God and have fellowship and community and growth with other young adults? How can we reach them in an effective method? Um, And that's really what we've been answering through Catholic 203. So Catholic 203 is a new initiative uh, or program of the diocese. And I say of the diocese because you've been very happy to uh, allow us to do it, but it's been built entirely young adults, entirely Amen. by young adults and entirely for young adults. Amen. Um, so Amen. no one over 31, <laughs> because I'm the oldest on the team at 30, <laughs> went into really the development and the designing of it. So what is it? So we are one central hub that connects young adults to all of the local communities near to them. So this is not a diocesan ministry. This is not a diocesan program. This is a resource that helps the individual connect to community. So if you're a young adult in Stanford, you can see all of the events happening in the greater Stanford region, all of the small communities happening in the greater Stanford region in one place. Because I just met a young adult who moved to Stanford seven months ago and spent seven months trying to connect with other young adults. He's attending mass, but he has no way to build a community that he can relate to inside of his faith. That's now been solved, but not just for Stanford, but for every corner and region of the diocese. Mm -hmm. So you can find us online at catholic203.com social media at catholic underscore 203 on Instagram. And we're also sending a weekly bulletin of all of the events happening 
in the next few weeks to young adults on a weekly basis, and then soon directly through text message updates and saying, hey, you know, there's a young adult mass happening at this parish on this date. We hope to see you there. And the goal is really to make it easy for young adults, whether they're active in the church or seeking community, to find it. I have to tell you, you have done more great work in the time you are as chair of the council than I did as chair for two and a half years, just for the record. And I'm very grateful to you and to your team. You put a team together too, Steve. Absolutely. Right? The chairs and, and of those Angelica is one of those right? team members. Lily and Valerie. And you have are been... one of them, Angelica. So yeah. it's both of you then. Exactly. Uh -huh. Lily and Valerie are also on the core team members, but it's really a community yep. effort. And, and that's the thing with young adults and with community is it's not – my work, it's not just Angelica's work. It's a group of people coming together and saying, as young adults, we have this need. What can we do to solve it together? Right. Right. It's and that's see, and that is in my mind empowerment that's meaningful. You know, you will go to parishes and with the best of intentions, people say, Well, we need a young adult on the pastoral council. And I'm saying to myself, and to do what? Like, in other words, it, it, is it just because we need a young adult in the room or is it that we're engaging a person's gifts and talents and being willing to listen to the idea? So, so what you're doing in your respective ministry is you're empowering the very people we want to serve to be served, but also to serve others and to, and to fashion the response that makes sense, which we who are, you know, bordering on the, you know, on the prehistoric age, be, I mean, we would not. I would have no idea <laughs> what, you're do what you're doing, right? But I'm delighted that yeah. you're doing it. Well, and I think it's, Bishop, it comes <laughs> down to is that in order to have a really strong sense of community, you need to have shared experiences. Mm -hmm. And while mm -hmm. I love the members of my parish community, if I go to a men's group and everyone else is talking about their grandchildren, and I have an eight-month-year-old who's my first, I can get a ton of wisdom from them but there's only a limited amount of shared experience I'm going to have just because the, the difference in life is going to be so much. And I think that's why community is so important, especially for young adults, because you can relate to people that are, you know, within your age graphic that are going through the same part of life and struggling with the same things and then together encouraging each other, you know, through that. Uh, and that's where it's, it's so important. And, and the other thing, too, that I think is is, is a valid uh, point to make, and that is with the best of intentions, those who are in the 60s and 70s, and although I'm not prehistoric, I am 64, if, even if I were married and had children, my raising children 40 years ago is very different from what you are experiencing now. So the wisdom is constant, but the experience is very different. Absolutely. Just like you mentioned just technology alone. Who would have? My father would never have worried about it. We didn't have no. them. <laughs> but now, who knows who visits these young people when they're in their bedrooms and they're smarter than their parents? Who knows who visits them on these in these computers and cell phones and tablets and all the rest? That's just a whole new frontier that you need people of like mind and age to say, well, how do you deal with this? Exactly. Right? Exactly. And and now I think there's still a place and a lot of times I'll be asked, well, what can I do as a, a seasoned Catholic to support young adults? <laughs> um, and there's really three answers to that, Bishop. And while the development part of me says, hey, we have a fundraising goal, that's true. That's honestly not the most important part. The most important part is to welcome young adults in while realizing they are adults. Because I think people will still say, oh, millennials, yeah, they're, they're in high school. Well, I'm a millennial, and what people will probably realize is millennials are now in their 40s or 30s. They're not high schoolers anymore. So reach out to them, invite them. Invite them onto the parish council, not because you need a young person, but because that young person probably has their CPA and has been working in an accountant for 15 years. And he's going to be a valuable resource on your finance council because he's up to date and knows how to run things in the most efficient way because he's working in it, right? Invite someone to be a youth minister because they've been ministering for years like Angelica. So 
That's the first mm-hmm. thing is invite mm-hmm. them. And then the second thing mm-hmm. is share. And it's share what's going on. And that's why we created Catholic 203. Because as a parent, as a grandparent, as a godparent, it's hard to go to your 20-something and say, hey, you should go to this mass. Because then they're going to mm-hmm. roll their eyes and they're like, okay, yep, crazy aunt, whatever, saying I need to go back to church. This way, we've created a method where you can simply say, shoot them a URL, shoot them the link to the website, share, shoot them the Instagram, and then let them explore and see what's out there um, to make it right. accessible to them right. without you forcing right. them. Right, right, right. So I, I hate to jump in, but uh, we are on the clock. So um, we need to take a break. <laughs> this is Let Me Be Frank on the Veritas Catholic Network. Uh, we've had... Stephen Villardo and Angelica Bacos with us. Uh, and we're going to come back on the other side of the break with a listener question. So we'll be right back. Okay, welcome back to Let Me Be Frank with Bishop Frank Caggiano. All right, Excellency, here's the question for you. It says, hi, Steve. Here's a question for Let Me Be Frank. Why did the church change the way we, re- we receive communion from the priest only giving the host to the person? Well, there there are many historical reasons for that. One of the principal dogmatic reasons is what the Council of of Trent teaches, that when one receives the host, you are receiving the body and blood of Jesus, not just his body. And when receives from the cup, you are receiving both the body and blood. So I think there were many things. It was in the, it was the reform of the liturgy. It was the emphasizing the priest as the proper and minister of the celebration of mass. So he needed to receive the cup. It was not essential that everyone else did because they all received, we all received the fullness of Christ's body and blood. Some of it is logistical. But I think as the liturgy evolved so that the, the priest was the, the emphasized minister, and he still remains the essential minister of the celebration of mass, there was... I, the, the need to receive both, to receive body and blood of Jesus, was not absolutely necessary anymore because the church holds its both cool. in both, right? Great. So if you have a question for Bishop Frank, send it in on social media, or you can email questions at veritascatholic.com. Bishop Frank Caggiano is on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. So is Veritas Catholic Network. And a big thank you to Foundations in Faith. A grant from the St. Therese Fund for Evangelization makes it possible for us to bring Let Me Be Frank to you. Foundations of Faith is committed to supporting and transforming pastoral ministries in the Diocese of Bridgeport, and you can learn more about their outstanding work at foundationsinfaith.org. And Stephen Villardo and Angelica Bacos, thank you very much for being here. Um, Again, uh, it's uh, catholic203.com and catholic underscore 203. That is correct. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Wow. Both of you, I'm deeply grateful for all the great work you do. It's tremendous. You're a great blessing to the diocese and to our young adult community. And um, and I'm here to help you, so I'm only a phone call away. And Steve, you and I are going to be – we're all going to be meeting in a few days for our, for our morning of prayer, which I'm looking forward to very much. Yes. All right, so let's ask the Lord's blessing, shall we? In the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. We give you thanks, Heavenly Father, this day and always, for the blessings you give us, and even for the opportunities we have in times of challenge to remain faithful and joyful and courageous witnesses. May your spirit come upon Angelica and Stephen and all with whom they work, that as they pioneer this great ministry to young adults, it will bear great fruit. And we ask that God bless you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, my friends. Thank you so much for having us. It was a joy to be here. Yeah, my pleasure. My pleasure. Steve, I'll see you next week.